and he is indeed coming again. We look forward to that with expectancy. We know it will be literal because his first coming was literally fulfilled according to all of the Old Testament prophecies, over 300 of them. Marvelous to know that we have a Lord who came as promised, died for our sins as was promised, was buried as was promised, and who rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures, and that was promised also. What a marvelous thought that is. And then ascended to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Our Lord is coming again. And we are going to see part of that tonight as we look into the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 1, looking at verses 9 through 20, Son of Man vision, part number 5. Last week, of course, we had Thanksgiving Sunday, the joint evening service with Marcus Hook, so we've only had one Sunday interruption between the last time we were in Revelation on the 12th and tonight. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to be ready, beginning to read in John, uh, in uh, verse 9, chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the earth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. Gracious Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, you might cause your word to penetrate our hearts and cause us to realize that these things are true. It states so at the end of the book of Revelation and that you will do these things quickly. And Father, we pray that we might be ready when our Lord comes back to find out whether his servants have been faithful to what he's called them to do. Father, we thank you for this time and we pray for your blessings upon it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just by way of introduction, I want you to focus for a moment on verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. John is writing in 96 AD. Most of the book of Revelation is things which are hereafter. The preterists say that the prophetic prophecies of the New Testament were fulfilled in 70 AD, more than 20 years before this book was written. 
That cannot be because most of the book is still future according to the Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke to John on the Isle of Patmos. The preterists are wrong. We'll talk about that more, but I just wanted to point that out one more time. You'll hear me say it multiple times because we are looking forward to things to come. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ focuses on after we get into chapter 4. So we've been studying the term, as you know, the day of the Lord because of the statement in verse 10 where we find the English phrase, the Lord's day. A term which, as you already know, the modern American church uses to refer to Sunday. What we've learned thus far, and I'm going to try to give you a summary, which is moving very quickly to get down to the Old Testament prophecies that we got partly through the last time we were together. But what we've learned thus far is that in Revelation, the term does not refer to Sunday. It refers to a time of judgment called the Day of the Lord, which was prophesied extensively in the Old Testament. To demonstrate this, we've been going through multiple passages in the Old Testament which speak clearly of the Day of the Lord, and we've seen that the description of this terrible time parallels exactly what we find in the book of Revelation. And it hasn't happened yet. How can you say everything was fulfilled by 70 AD? So in a summary, thus far we've seen the following 10 contrasts and comparisons balancing the Old Testament and the New Testament. This demonstrates to us that the day of the Lord spoken of in Revelation is the same as the day of the Lord spoken of over and over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. So if you're discussing this subject, I don't say arguing, but if you're discussing this subject with someone, these are some key points, and we did a lot of study on them. I'm just going to summarize them tonight. If you want to write down the 10 points, I'm just going to give them to you in line. If you're discussing the issue of prophecy with someone who denies future prophecy, if they're, for example, amillennialists, you know, if they're postmillennialists, if they are, you know, preterists, these are 10 key issues that you can give that show that the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is the future day of the Lord in the book of Revelation. First, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is prophetic. In the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord is prophetic. Number two, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord relates to Israel. In the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord relates to Israel. Third, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is still future. In the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord is still future. Fourth, and this is a little more complex, has more stuff packed into it, so listen carefully. Fourth, in the Old Testament, we do not see the church going through the day of the Lord because in the Old Testament, the church was a mystery. So you say, well, how can you make the comparison? All right, here's the comparison. In the New Testament, even after the church is revealed, that's Acts chapter 2, we do not find the church of the Lord going, uh, church going through the day of the Lord in Revelation because the rapture has already taken place, which is what we find in 2 Thessalonians. So although you don't see the church in the Old Testament and the day of the Lord is prophesied, in the New Testament you don't see the church going through the tribulation because the rapture has already occurred. I hope you understand that. That's one of the reasons why it's important to keep the key differences between Israel and the church in view. Israel and the church are not the same. And by the way, you remember when we were going through this, in that context we discussed why the church is not under the law. People who try to confuse Israel and the church tend to be people who put you back under the law. And the New Testament is explicitly clear, book of Galatians especially, explicitly clear that the church is not under the law. So if you make Israel the church, you're putting the church back under the law. We also talked about why Israel, not the church, observes the Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath, is never called the Sabbath in the New Testament. You hold, remember, we had a big, huge, long discussion about that. Number five, when the Old Testament closed, the day of the Lord had not yet come. It's still being anticipated. The day of the Lord has not yet come during the church period of history. 
Paul makes it clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, that the day of the Lord is still future when Paul wrote that. Paul also gives the practical application as to how we should live since the day of the Lord has not arrived. That's all one package there. But let me just read you the passage so that you'll see it again. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Why not? Because you're not going to go through it. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, notice the differences between they and us. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4, but ye, now we're talking about the ye, the, the, those guys over there and us over here. Here we got the two teams, okay? But ye, brethren, are not in doctors that that day, what day? He told you what day in verse 2, the day of the Lord. That day shall not overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, now, how should you live in light of that since you don't know how long you've got on this earth? And boy, have we been reminded of that this week. How should you live? Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9. Now, what's he been talking about? Verse 2. The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Verse 4, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 9, what's the day of the Lord all about? It's God's judgment on the earth. Verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is making it very clear that God's day of wrath is not for the believer. It's for those who are walking in darkness, those who are in rebellion, those who have rejected him, who are of the night. But we are children of the day. We are children of the light. In other words, as we just read, the New Testament specifically states that the day of the Lord had not yet happened when Paul wrote, and he specifically states that the church will not go through that time of unprecedented judgment upon the wicked earth. Number six, six main point when you're talking to somebody who denies the rapture of the church, who denies a real literal tribulation, who denies a real literal millennium. Number six, in the Old Testament, we contrast God pouring out his wrath on the earth where we see in the New Testament the world pouring out persecution on Christians. The Apostle Paul says it clearly, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, question for you. The persecution, the trouble that Christians go through, is that trouble coming from God in heaven as he's pouring out wrath on the earth? Or is that trouble coming from pagans, from unbelievers who are pouring out wrath on Christians? The Bible specifically says we're going to suffer trouble in this world, and the trouble is not going to be coming from God. The trouble is becoming from the pagans, from the wicked people around us. That is totally different from what you see in the book of Revelation where God is pouring out his wrath on the wicked people on earth who on earth are standing there shaking their fists at heaven and cursing God. Never let somebody muddy the waters by saying, well, Christians have always been thrown to the lions and Christians have always been put into jail and Christians have always been persecuted and Christians have always been murdered. Okay, yeah, that's true. And we know that. And the Bible tells us it's going to happen. But that is not the same as God judging the earth for its wickedness. And the saints in heaven crying out, Thou art true and just, O Lord, for they have shed the blood of your saints and you have given them blood to drink. God's not giving the church blood to drink. That's what God is doing to the pagans. Always distinguish between the world pouring out persecution on Christians and God pouring out wrath on the wicked world. That's a very important point to remember. So that was point number six. Seven, it's always related, that is the day of the Lord, is always related to Christ's second coming, never to his first coming. The day of the Lord is always, every place you find it in the Bible, is always related to Christ's second coming, not to his first coming. 
and Jesus has not yet come back. The preterists, how can they deal with that? Jesus hasn't come back yet. I mean, they, they look at the city of Jerusalem being destroyed in 70 AD and say, well, all those prophecies got fulfilled. Now, wait a minute. Did Jesus come back then? No. I mean, that almost moves into Jehovah's Witness theology, or Seventh-day Adventist theology, I mean, where Christ makes this, you know, <clears throat> second coming that you can't see kind of a thing. The Lord has not yet returned. So the preterists are dead wrong. This is written in 96 AD, 26 years after they say it already happened. Seventh, uh, that was number eighth now. The set of the... Um, the day of the Lord is never related to the rapture other than the fact that it starts immediately after the rapture. Whenever you find the rapture discussed in the New Testament, the day of the Lord is not related to the rapture other than the fact that it starts immediately after the rapture. Ninth, the day of the Lord begins with a period referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. I'd hoped to be able to get to that a couple of weeks ago, but we, you know, this is so important for foundation. You got to learn the foundation before you can build the superstructure. So I'm trying to really summarize all those humongous number of passages that we've looked at, and uh, we'll get to the 70th week eventually, but this is number nine. The day of the Lord begins with a period referred to as the 70th week of Daniel, which specifically and distinctly relates to national Israel. 70th week of Daniel is related to thy people. God, or Michael speaking to Daniel, Gabriel speaking to Daniel, excuse me, and saying, you know, thy people. All the way through, and we'll be studying that prophecy in Daniel a little more in depth later on, but it's always related to Israel. The 69th week of Daniel ended to the day, as prophesied by Daniel, with, quote, the cutting off of Messiah the Prince, that is, with the crucifixion of Christ. That was literal, it was exact, the timing was precise to the day when Jesus died on the cross as prophesied in the book of Daniel. Once the church has gone, the 70th week related to Israel starts again, and that's specifically tied into Israel's time clock. Number 10. We find here that it is, stems from his coming as a thief in the night to the destruction and melting of the current heavens and the earth. And in addition to the passage cited above out of 1 Thessalonians 5, we looked at a number of the key New Testament references. So those are 10 reasons why when somebody you're talking to does not believe in the rapture, they do not believe in a literal seven-year tribulation, they do not believe in a literal millennium, and they can float in either direction, either post-millennial or amillennial or preterist. Those are ten reasons that you can give that are very clear in Scripture to refute the false positions so that you don't come to weird conclusions when you're looking at the book of Revelation. Some of you remember Harold Camping, and uh, some of the odd interpretations that he had, he would quote passage out of Revelation, you say, where did he come with up, up with that? It's because he started with wrong premises. And if you use these ten premises, which can be demonstrated easily in Scripture, then you don't come to those false conclusions that he was coming to. You know, like, for example, I, I can still remember hearing him on the radio. I didn't listen to him very often, but occasionally it came on while I was driving. And um, he said, now here it says, a third of the ships in the sea were destroyed. And I look at that and I say, yeah, a third of the ships in the sea were destroyed. Harold Camping said, that means a third of the gospel witness is no longer going forth into the earth. And I thought, wait a minute, where did it say that? A third of the gospel witness? Because, he said, ships are used historically in the church to speak of carrying the gospel to foreign lands. Now, wait a minute, how did you get from what the Bible said to missionaries going to foreign lands carrying the gospel and saying a third of the witness of the gospel will be destroyed in the book of Revelation. I mean, folks, that's not exegesis, that's eisegesis. 
What you do is you start with the text, you compare scripture with scripture, you've got New Testament prophecy that clearly ties in with Old Testament prophecy because it's talking about the same thing. You put them together and you come to a conclusion and see that God has always fulfilled prophecy literally, exactly, precisely to the day, to the hour, to the minute, to the second. God never misses it. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Did God have a precise point in history when he was going to interject and send the Messiah to earth? Or did he just sort of bumble along and say, well, I guess now's as good a time as any, and well, it looks like there's a lady down there that might make a suitable mom, and you know, oh, I guess we'll do it. Do you think God acts like that? We have a God who controls, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Not a sparrow falls without your father. Do you think he's going to do guesswork on prophecy? Do you think it's going to be haphazard? And when he talks to us about it, do you think he's sitting up there laughing and saying, boy, they're never going to figure this one out? The book of Revelation is the revelation. Apocalypse is the unveiling of Jesus Christ as the judge. God is making it clear so that people will not go to hell, that instead they will know that there is a Savior and he is also the judge. You may think that I'm belaboring this, but this is so important to get this foundation so that you can understand what's happening in the rest of the book of Revelation. Then we parallel the study with some other significant prophetic passages in the Gospels. We're not going to go over all those. In Matthew 24, which is the Olivet Discourse, also looking at 25, Israel, not the church, is in view. That's very, very clear. We noted the motif of the thief in the night repeated multiple times. We saw four distinctives of national Israel are given in Matthew 24 that shows that Matthew 24 does not relate to the church. What are the four things? The temple, we don't have the temple. The Sabbath, we're not under Sabbath law. Jerusalem and Judea, we're not living in Jerusalem and Judea. And signs. Those are the four biggies when you read through Matthew 24 and 25. So you know what Jesus is talking about there? which is the Great Tribulation period, what Jesus is talking about does not relate to the church. So you've got to be either, you know, these are only three options that you have in relation to the Tribulation. Yeah, you've got to be pre, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Or, of course, I guess you could say, well, nothing's going to happen. Just the trouble that we go through, that's the Tribulation. That never describes what you have in the book of Revelation or in Matthew 24. Four things that make it clear it's Israel. The temple, the Sabbath, Jerusalem and Judea, and the signs. We saw that those are the key to the intended audience of Matthew 25, uh, 24 and 25, the Jews, not the church. And the church is not to be seeking after signs. Paul said so in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23. The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. It's the Jews that need the signs and seek after signs. You remember we did a a study, I'm not going to go over it all again. We uh, did a study of the 76 times the Jews sought a sign in the singular in the Bible. Noted that five out of 67 verses using the term sign occur in epistles and revelation. And of those five, three clearly refer to Jews and the other two appear to refer to Jews. Signs relate to Jews. And that's what all of those prophecies are the signs for this and the signs for that and the signs for this. And God sends a sign upon the earth. The church is not here. It's in heaven. Then we looked at the term signs in the plural. The term signs in the plural occurs 52 times in 53 verses. 49 times the signs used in the Old Testament. Only 12 occurrences are in Acts and the Epistles. And of those nine times the term sign is used in the Gospel, speaking to Jews. The other two times the term sign occurs, it refers to the Antichrist. And further reducing the number to 12, we find the term signs is used concerning the apostles did outside the context of Jews only five times. Signs focus on Jews. And then we saw that only one place in the Old Testament is used outside the context of the Jews, and that's Genesis 1.14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The rest of the time in the Old Testament where signs singular or signs plural is found, it's always in the context of Jews. Then we briefly went over the many passages which clearly state that signs are for the Jews. We looked at 38 other times in the Old Testament where the term signs occur and always in the context of Israel, not the church. 
I'm giving you a lot of summaries by not going over all 38 verses and all 57 verses and all 66 verses and so on. But then we find it in the context of Samaritans, half Gentiles and half Jews. The only time we find it where there were probably Jews, but we can't prove it, is Acts chapter 14, verse 3. Therefore, both they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony of the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders done by their hands. We find Jews and Gentiles together in Romans 15, 9. We find apostolic signs in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Hebrews 2, 4. We find the signs of the Antichrist who is trying to copy Christ. And where is he going to set up his temple? In Paris? In Moscow? In Washington? Well, sometimes you think the Antichrist is one of some of those places. But it says he's going to set it up in Jerusalem. That's Jewish context. We talked about Jesus having to deal with the issue of signs in relation to Jews in the Gospels many different times. We find Jewish apostles in Matthew 24 clearly looking for signs as they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. They say, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus begins to describe, because the church was not yet revealed, Jesus begins to describe what's going to happen during the tribulation period. Book of Revelation, of course, is full of signs, and we've talked a lot about that. The context we discussed, Luke 12, 35 through 40, the wedding feast of the Lamb taking place. While the tribulation is happening on earth, we're at the wedding. We are not going to be on earth. Jesus is not going to have a wedding feast up in heaven, and the bride's not present. I mean, that would really be weird. Can you all imagine? We hold a wedding here at the church, and uh, the groom comes in, and the best men, and the bridesmaids come down, and the bride doesn't show up. And they go through the ceremony, and here's the groom standing up here. You take so-and-so, wherever she is, to be your wife. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, I'd like to say you can kiss the bride, but she's not here. Let's all go over and have a wedding feast. What kind of a weird wedding would that be? Oh, hey, the bride's out there getting beat up by a gang of thugs, but that's all right, don't worry about it. At the, seven years later, we'll be able to pull her in here. <laughs> It's hard for me to understand how people miss this. He's returning from the wedding. While all this stuff has been going on, the wedding feast of the Lamb is taking place in heaven. All of those studies are in the context of present-day America. Peter talks about it, the kind of apostasy that precedes the rapture as a denial of the creation and the flood. We've talked about that at a great deal. You know that's one of my favorite subjects. That's over in 2 Peter chapter 3. And we see the judgments that God is sending are parallel. We find the judgment by water, then we find the judgment by fire. In the middle of all that, we talked about the thief in the night motif. That was repeated over and over again. Then we studied the foundational principles that are necessary to the term prophetic chronology in general. And we talked about the Old Testament prophecies that speak of the day of the Lord, Israel, and its relationship to the Gentile nations always being in view. And those give explicit notice that there is a time of judgment on the earth. We looked in Isaiah, we looked in Lamentations, and in Ezekiel. And then we ended last time by looking at the prophecy in Joel chapter 2, which is quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. That's the point of transition. That's a very important point of transition to understand. So we just covered it real briefly. That's where we're going to start tonight. Now, I hope you got at least an outline of those, the 10 points especially, the other things were important too, but those 10 points that I gave you, so you can answer people who deny the literal prophecies of Scripture. Now, over in Acts chapter 2, uh, we find Peter quoting Acts 2 in the Sermon on the Day of Pentecost, which is the opening of the church. He only extracts two issues out of that big long passage in Joel, he begins with a quote about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, which is what you have and on the day of Pentecost where the, all the apostles begin to speak these foreign languages that they've never learned, but they're there in the courtyard of the men in the temple, and those of you who are with us in the book of Acts know we discussed in detail in Acts chapter 2, how do we know that it's only men in the courtyard? Well, it uses the term for males. If you've got men and women, even if you only got one woman there, you have to use anthropos. That's people. You know, we get the word anthropology from that. But when you've got only males, you can use the term aner. Ye men of Israel, ye males of Israel. There was one place in what's called Habayit, the house. That's 
the house of the Lord, that's the temple, there was only one place where only men could go. And that was the courtyard of the men, which is where they could look over a little tiny knee rail and they could see the priests flaying the offerings and see them washing in the brazen labor and watch as the high priest would go through the doors and go in toward the Holy of Holies. The men could see that the women couldn't. They were out in the courtyard of the women. On the day of Pentecost, Peter and the other apostles are there fulfilling one of the Old Testament feasts which God commanded. They're Jews in the Jewish temple and suddenly the Holy Spirit is given. Now he's always been omnipresent. But in a new special way, he takes up residence in the bodies of the apostles in Acts chapter 2. And it's proved by the Shekinah glory. The fire comes down and lights on their hair, and it doesn't burn their hair. Not one of them had to go to the barber afterward and say, would you shave that bald spot off and let's hope the hair grows back? That showed that God had chosen a new temple. Just like the Shekinah glory had rested over the tabernacle. We've talked about that this morning. Just like it rested over Solomon's temple. In fact, it was so blazingly beautiful that it drove the priests out from ministering. They knew God was there. In the book of Ezekiel, it disappears. It comes from the top of the temple and it moves over to the edge, to the, to the outer wall, and then it goes across the valley and up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and then it disappears into the wilderness. God removing his presence as a sign of judgment on Israel. And now suddenly it's back in the temple, but it's not resting on the temple. It's resting on the heads of some men. And they begin to speak these foreign languages and people begin to understand that there are 18 different specific languages that are mentioned in Acts chapter 2 that these guys who had never studied a day in their life in those places were speaking with fluency and with power. That's the birthday of the church because from there we move to where we're bringing in not just people who are 100% Jews, but we move over to Acts chapter 8 and we bring in the Samaritans and then we bring in and they're half Jewish and half Gentiles and they still got copies of the Samaritan Pentateuch and you know they, they're sort of following Jewish law but they got some paganism mixed in and then you get to the end of Acts 8 and you have the Ethiopian eunuch and he's 100% Gentile by birth but he's neither male nor female <laughs> men only in Acts 2 men and women are mentioned in Acts 8 with Samaria and then we have a guy who's neither male nor female and he's Gentile by birth and Jewish by religion God's bringing them in. God bring them in. The, the gospel expanding to all sorts of different people. Get to Acts chapter 10. We've got not only Gentiles. They are the Gentile oppressors. They are the Romans. Cornelius and his household who are brought in to the one body. And suddenly, Peter begins to realize, you know what? God's doing something we never saw before. Because Paul tells us the church, Ephesians 3, 3 and 4, the church is a mystery. It was not revealed in the Old Testament, as Paul explains there, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That we'd have both Jews and Gentiles in one body. The middle of the wall of partition has been broken down. It's unique. But the cutting off of Messiah the Prince was the end of the 69th week, that is, 69th sevens, 40, 483 years, from the time that the proclamation went forth to rebuild the temple until Messiah was cut off to the day. But that 70th week hasn't happened. We've got the cutting off of Messiah the Prince, but what about those last seven years that Daniel prophesied? Oh, God is gracious. He could have said it immediately with the coming of the Messiah. You killed my son, I'm going to send my wrath upon the earth. But instead what he did was take the, the death of the Messiah and he poured out grace on the earth. That's powerful, people. If your son were taken by wicked men and you'd sent your son to offer them hope and life and riches eternal, if you'd sent your son to do that and they scorned him and spit on him and beat him and lied about him and falsely accused him, tortured him and nailed him to a cross and killed him, would you say, I'm going to send grace? Or would you have gone right into the 70th week of Daniel and sent your wrath, your judgment? 
shows the difference between God and man. But God says it will come. But meanwhile, I'm going to open the door so not just Jews, but those who are half Jewish, half Gentile, those who are neither male nor female, those who may have Jewish religion but Gentile background, those who are 100% Gentile, not just Gentiles, but, but the persecutors of Israel, I will open the door of the floodgates of grace and I will put them back under the law. And people who confuse Israel and the church put you back under the law. But God says, I've opened grace. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the opportunity to trust Christ. And for 2,000 years, God has withheld his judgment. Oh, you think of the wicked things that men have done over the last 2,000 years. You think of the wickedness in America today. And yet God is still pouring out his grace. How long, O oh Lord, until this time ends and the church is taken up and the floodgates of wrath open as the 70th week of Daniel, those last seven years prophesied by Daniel the prophet, hit the earth. Do you understand why it's so essential that we should be about our master's business? Yes, I believe in predestination. Yes, I believe in election. Yes, I believe there are a certain number of elect out there. But God has given us the job of telling all the good news. Because we don't know who they are. We preach it indiscriminately. And then God takes his word and irresistibly draws them to himself. Oh, the grace and long suffering of our Savior. And so we find Peter is quoting out of Acts 2, but he picks up two things. He starts with a quote about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that was clearly taking place on the day of Pentecost, as we've just described. Then he ends the quote with the passage that says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are the two points that Peter then picks out of Joel and begins to preach to the Jews, the Jewish men, in the courtyard of the men in the temple. Two things. Number one, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It's happening today, says Peter. Number two, you guys took Jesus and by wicked hands you've crucified and slain him. But whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it says they were pricked to their hearts. They were crying out, man, brethren, what must we do? Peter says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thine house. And that day, 3,000 Jewish men, which was about the maximum number that could be held in the courtyard of the men, were baptized. They made an open profession that they had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Much to the consternation of the priests who were watching the scene, but couldn't do anything about it. They've got 3,000 guys out there that are ready to, to lynch and tar them. They're not about to touch the Messiah's there, but uh, the apostles there, but we find that happening then in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5. We find them threatening them, putting pressure on them, trying to keep them from preaching in the name of Jesus. They tell them, saying, you're bringing his blood upon us. Look, they are the ones who brought it on them. They're the ones that stood there and said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Talk about people making false accusations. I mean, that's what we talked about in the morning worship service. You see exactly the same thing with the priests in the temple against the apostles. Well, I've got off the subject. Anyway, we only touched on that briefly a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so we've covered it a little bit more in depth tonight. In our discussion of prophecy, Pentecost is the birthday of the church. A transition from Israel to a new program that God is beginning in Acts 2 while putting the program on Israel on hold. He has not forgotten or forsaken his people. Paul says so. Paul says so in Romans chapter 11. We find him mentioning it again briefly in chapter 13, which is the authority of government. Romans says, what? Hath God put away his people which he foreknow? Watch ye not? What he says to Elias? Elias says, look, I'm the only one left. And God says to Elias, look, I still have 7,000 men that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. We don't see everything God's doing right now. There's still those who are the elect who have yet not come to Christ. 
God has done what he said he would do by drawing Israel from all the nations and putting them back in their own land in an impossible situation and keeping them alive. But they've come back in unbelief. There has to be a nation for the tribulation to occur. And he's giving them witnesses today as he did in the past. Some of them are my friends. And sharing the good news of their Messiah in their very midst. Even in the Knesset. Oh people, God keeps his word literally, exactly, precisely. Every prophecy will come true exactly like God said it will come true. That's why I have laid this foundation so the people who want to muddy the waters in confusion and say, oh, it's not going to happen. It's all going to be over and blah, blah, blah. You can say, look, here are 10 reasons that it's not over and why God still has a purpose for Israel. Very important. All right, so now we have talked about Joel chapter 2, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Um, then we moved last week. We looked through a couple of other passages. We looked at the prophecy in Amos about the day of the Lord. And Joel, by the way, not only in chapter 2, but also in chapter 3, talks about the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 3, he says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. Does that sound like anything you've heard in the book of Revelation? It sure does. That hasn't happened yet. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will have the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Sion, in Zion, my holy mountain. Tell me what's in Zion today. What is on the holy mountain today? Yes, two mosques. The Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. A gold dome and a silver dome. Is Messiah ruling in them? Is Messiah speaking out of them? No. We have here a prophecy in Joel that the Messiah is going to be speaking out of them and it's going to be preceded by the sun and the moon being darkened. And we find the heathen being wakened to come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge the heathen round about. Has he done that yet? Listen to the next verse. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Do we find anything in the book of Revelation that talks about an angel putting in a sickle for the, for the harvest is ripe? The book of Revelation is quoting what's taking place here in Joel. And it hasn't happened yet. So either God is lying to us, or else past prophecy is totally different from future prophecy, whereas past prophecy is, is, is fulfilled literally and exactly and specifically, but future prophecy, we just sort of muddle through it and it doesn't really happen, and we pretend it's happened. Is that the way God works? I don't think so. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall also roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake. The Lord shall be the hope of his people, the strength of the children of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no stranger pass through her any more. That's closing out the tribulation when Messiah returns and establishes his throne in Har Zion, Mount Zion. Oh, people, when I read these passages, and I've been there, and it rejoices me to think all of that wicked, rubble, satanic stuff will be gone, and Jesus will rule from Mount Zion. He will enter that gate which the Muslims have barred up. The graves they've planted in front of it will be blown out of the way and he will come in triumphant and rule those are great thoughts let's look over to Amos chapter 5 Amos chapter 5 verse 16 we have more things describing for us here 
what the day of the Lord is like. Amos 5, verse 16, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas! And they shall call the husbandmen to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing, and in the vineyard shall be wailing, for I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Let me pause here for just a second. Around the first coming of Jesus, there was a, a magnificent amount of Jewish expectation of the coming of the Messiah. People had an expectancy based on the prophetic scriptures in Jeremiah and in Daniel. There were some who began to pick up on it out of Isaiah, especially the prophecies about his birth in Bethlehem, though there's argument among the people, and it's recorded for us in the Gospels, as to, you know, well, how can any good come out of Nazareth? Because those folks didn't know he'd been born in Bethlehem. But some people did. You remember the shepherds? You know what? There's a lot of expectancy in Israel today, too, that the Messiah might be coming soon. But Amos is saying, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, because the rabbis think of the day of the Lord as only judging the Gentiles, of only judging the outsiders and making everything cushy and rosy for Israel. But that's not the way the prophets describe it. Because it relates to the 70th week of Daniel. And he says it's going to happen to your people. Daniel's people are the Jews. Back to Amos. For I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. <laughs> Talk about irony. Man, there's a lion back there. Let's, throw, let's run, 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 And you run right smack into a bear. He says, mmm, dinner. Or went into a house. So you're running away and you get inside the house and you think, man, whew, got away. And you lean on the wall. And he leaned his head on the wall and a serpent bit him. You can't get away. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? even very dark and no brightness in it. You find that in the book of Revelation. It hasn't happened yet. Obadiah. How many of you can find Obadiah within 15 seconds? <laughs> Give it a shot. See if you can find it. Flip open your Bibles. Look for Obadiah. Five. When you find it, raise your hand. Ten. Fifteen. No hands. Well, it's in there. Let me read you three verses. Verse 15, 16, and 17. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. You see, the end of the day of the Lord in the tribulation period part the end of that is the battle of Armageddon. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. You want to drink? Okay. You'll drink yourself out of existence. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Now, the ones that I really like, out of Zephaniah and Zechariah. You see, the Old Testament is not silent on this subject. We're not studying these in depth. I'm just giving them to you and making a few comments. It's all over the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests, and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. The day of the Lord said, do you remember anything where it talks about God has prepared a feast 
and there's some sacrifices and it's the vultures that come and eat them. We find Christ coming back to earth. And they take seven years to bury the dead. And it talks about it as the Lord's sacrifice. That's revelation. It's a reference here to Zephaniah. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. You bet they will. They're getting annihilated. Verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Getting rid of all those pagans. Who are the ones that are currently there? Who are giving Israel trouble all the time. Who are claiming it for their own. Who are making terrorist attacks. Killing women and children. Not just military soldiers. Who are those people that don't belong in the land? Because God gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not to Ishmael. Move down to chapter 2. Verse 2. Before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, O ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. There are going to be some people saved during the tribulation. We see that very clearly when we, for sure, talk about the 144,000 over in the book of Revelation. But he says, you better be prepared because it is going to be really, really bad. Who's he talking to? Is this the church he's talking to? Or is this Israel? This is Israel. Look over at Zechariah chapter 14. It is an incredible passage. Zechariah chapter 14. Beginning in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. So what are we talking about here? The day of the Lord. It describes what's going to happen. It's exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against the nation. Did the Lord go forth when Jerusalem was destroyed the first time in 70 AD and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle? See, the preterists will take verse 1 and 2 and they'll say, oh, that was fulfilled by Titus in 70 AD. How about verse 3? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So if you take the first verses literally... You've got to take these verses literally too. We're talking about the same location at the same time all this is going on. The Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And you see many of those instances in the Old Testament like is with the book of uh, Joshua of uh, fighting against Jericho, fighting against the, you know, when the sun stood still. His fate shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. It's going to become a split. There shall be a very great valley. Has this happened yet? Does anybody think this has happened yet? We're talking about literal prophecy here, people. Either God is lying to us or he's telling us the truth. It is not allegorical mythology. And all this stuff relates to the day of the Lord. And all of this stuff is described in the book of Revelation. It's still future. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled in the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. 
Was the earthquake real in the day of King Uzziah of Judah? Yes. Is this going to be real? Yes. And the Lord thy God shall come and all the saints with thee. Wow. Does that sound like the second coming described at the end of the tribulation in the book of Revelation? It is. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night. But it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Suddenly everything is in reverse. The earth is in convulsions. Paul talks about it as being in travail, as a, as a woman in labor. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem. Half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. In other words, half of it's going to go down toward the Mediterranean. Half of it's going to go down to the Dead Sea. Because Jerusalem sitting here up in the mountains of Judea and the valley being split and suddenly God's causing water to come up out of it. Has this happened yet? And half of it's running down to the Dead Sea to make it fresh. Half of it's running down into the Mediterranean Sea. Has this happened yet? No. You see, the day of the Lord hasn't gotten here yet. All of these things relate to the day of the Lord. And it's all described in the book of Revelation. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. That's reminiscent of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And it doesn't use Echad, it uses Yachid, which is a composite one. Not like an apple, which is a singular one, but like an orange, which is a composite one. There's one orange, but there are many segments inside. It's a veiled reference to the Trinity. All the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. It shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place in the first gate, under the corner gate from the Tower of Hananiel, under the king's winepress. The walls of Jerusalem are not in the same configuration that they were in the days of King David. And all men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall, safe, shall be safely inhabited. Has that happened yet? Is Jerusalem safely inhabited? This shall be the plague whereof the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Listen to this. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall cons consume away into their holes. Their tongue shall consume away into their mouth. Sounds like a pretty awesome fire blast, doesn't it? And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. They shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor and on the hand shall rise against hand of his neighbor. Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, the mule, the camel, the ass, all the beasts that shall come in, in these tents as, as this plague. And it shall come to pass, thus where they're all blasted, it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Has this happened? I mean, he's talking about not sort of mystical, there will sort of be a misty thing which we do not know what exactly it is or what it's going to do. I mean, that's not, what we're, that's not the kind of prophecy you find in the Bible. That's not like the Oracle of Delphi. It's not like the demonic mystics who give you prophecies reading your palm. This is very specific and it relates to a specific location and specific events tied to the day of the Lord, which is prophesied all over the Old Testament. It's not just in one place you find that phrase. And it parallels what's going on in the book of Revelation. It shall come to pass, even from year to year, they will go up to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It shall be that whosoever will not come of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Now look, is the whole earth coming to Jerusalem to worship the king of kings? And the ones that are refusing to come, does it mean, do you see it today, in their countries, there is no rain falling upon the earth? You say, no, okay, if this is true prophecy, 
is still future. And he's been talking about the day of the Lord, which he described in detail, and we see the same stuff over in the book of Revelation. And then we see in the book of Revelation also a picture of the millennial reign of Christ from Jerusalem, which we have here, the king sitting in Jerusalem. And the people of the earth are going to obey him. And he's going to guarantee they obey him because if they don't, they're not going to get any rain. They won't have any crops. They're going to starve. Only God can stop the rain. Only God can start the rain again. This shall be the punishment of Egypt. Oh, there's some specific countries listed. And the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Right now, there are people who have Canaanite ancestry in their blood mixed with Moab and Ammon and Ishmael and Edom that inhabit the Mount of the Lord. In that day, there won't be one. Turn to Malachi chapter 4. We're almost done. Our time is up, but this is the last one I'll cover for you tonight. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that ye shall leave ne them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. That's the Messiah. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before coming the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The disciples asked Jesus a question about that verse. Jesus said, they don't realize it, but John the Baptist gave them a shot at it, and they blew it. Yet there is coming a day in which Elijah Think about the prophet Elijah. What happened to the prophet Elijah? He was walking with Elisha and the sons of the prophets came out on a couple of occasions and said, hey, you know, your master's going to be taken away from you. He says, I know it, I know it. Be quiet. And he kept on going and Elijah told him, hey, go back. He says, I'm not going to leave you, you know, because I know you're going to be taken up today and I want to be there when you get taken up. And they went a little farther. He said, Elijah, go on, go on, go back, go back. No, nah, I'm not going to do it, not going to do it. So Elijah says, well, so what do you want? He says, well, I want a double portion of your blessing. Elijah said, that's a really tough thing to ask. <laughs> Elijah had a lot of portion of blessing. He said, but if you see me when I go up, you get it. And as they're walking along, suddenly the chariot of fire comes and separates between them. And Elisha cries out, my father, my father, the chariot of he saw it and Elijah's mantle falls off the sign of his authority and Elisha picks it up what was the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof that's the Shekinah that's the Shekinah glory I wish we had more time to talk about that one tonight and how that ties in with some specific prophecies in the book of Psalms and, you know, Psalm 68, for example, where it explains that the chariots of God is the Shekinah glory. And he goes to the Jordan River and he says, where's the God of Elijah? And he rolls it up and he smacks the water and the water parts for him and he walks across on dry ground. 
And he comes to the school of the prophets and says, hey, where's your master? The Lord took him up. Oh, I think he may have gotten taken up in a whirlwind or something. And, you know, and the, and the, the, the chariot separated them. The whirlwind took him up. And maybe it was just a normal whirlwind. And it, it might have dropped him on the mountain someplace. And we're really sad about that. They said, we're going to go look for him. No, don't go. Yeah, yeah we got to go. They go look. They can't find him. Elisha said, I told you not to go. And Elisha got a double portion of Elijah's blessings. Twice as many miracles are recorded of Elisha as are recorded of Elijah. Elijah is going to return. That's part of the great promise of the day of the Lord. Well, anyway, as you can see, the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, is clearly anticipated and described in the Old Testament. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Because we're going to see, as you look at those passages, now I mentioned it going through, hope you picked it up, that some of the passages deal with the tribulation. Some of them deal with the second coming. Some of them deal with the millennial reign of Messiah, but they all speak of that period called the day of the Lord. And we'll resolve that, the Lord willing, next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power, for the opportunity that we've had to study it tonight. How we thank you that your word is true. Your yea is always yea. Your nay is always nay. You're not ambivalent. You don't hide it from us. You reveal it to us. Because you want us as your children to understand you, for you are our Father. And you want us to understand it in the context of what kind of a God you are, so we had better obey you if we don't want to get spanked. So, Father, once again, we thank you for what we've learned tonight, and we pray that you will bless it to our hearts and cause us to realize that our Lord is not merely our Savior, but he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord of glory, the sovereign of the universe, the dweller of the Shekinah, the Messiah of Israel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God with us and ransom captive Israel. Thank you, Father, for your word. Bless it to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.